Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, E.J. Dion. I write a column for the Washington Post and work at the Brookings Institution in Georgetown. I just want to say it's a real honor to be here today for two reasons. One is that I've admired the work of Vera for a very long time. I used to cover uh, state government in New York, and we were talking about issues in prisons uh, back then in the 70s and 1980s, and Vera's work has uh, always been extraordinary. And I also am honored to be here because this is not only a very important cause, but in a city that is so deeply divided that we're even arguing about presidents negotiating treaties. Uh, this is one issue where we actually have a chance over the next couple of years to do something instructive because there is a broad coalition <coughs> that's been built around this issue uh, from uh, right to left or left to right in fairness to either. Uh, and uh, I think that that's very exciting because it's an issue uh, that really matters. We have an, ex uh, an extraordinary peer, pair here today. Um, Nick Turner uh, joined Vera as its fifth president and director. That's very impressive, five presidents in an organization that started in 1954. Um, he came to Vera from the Rockefeller Foundation where he was a managing director. Uh, Bob Rubin was the 70th uh, Secretary of the Treasury from January 10th, 1995 until July 2nd, 1999. He joined the Clinton administration in 1993 as the first director of the National Economic Council. He is co-chair of the Council on Foreign Relations and chairman of the board of the uh, Local Initiative Support Corporation, which I just learned my late colleague David Broder called, what was it, Bob? The most important unknown institution in America. <laughs> well, and, um, and that would be true of Vera if it were unknown. Um, <laughs> let me start uh, with you, uh, Bob, which is um, to ask, why did you, have you gotten involved in this? And you know, we were talking before, you, you were saying that this is an issue that every American actually ought to care about. Uh, could you take it from there? Sure. Uh, it started a long time ago, E.J., when, when Mario Cuomo was still governor, he formed a little group of people that he wanted to have advise him on different issues, and he asked me if I would take a look at poverty, and the conclusion I drew from all that was that poverty was not only a terrible human issue and a terrible moral issue, but also an enormous economic issue, and that if we can combat poverty effectively, and this will fast forward in one second to this, fast <laughs> combat poverty effectively, we could have sa tremendous savings to social costs and tremendous additions to productivity. And through that, E.J., I became conversant with the problems around the dysfunctionalities of our criminal justice system with respect to sentencing and rehabilitation and prison release and so much else. Fast forward to the present, uh, there's something called the Hamilton Project, which is a, a small policy development and promulgation project that quite a number of us are involved with, I think quite good actually. And we decided we would look at the excesses and, and, and the dysfunctionalities of our criminal justice system through an economic lens. It's obviously a terrible human problem, a terrible social problem, but the conclusion we reached was it was also a tremendous economic problem that it created tremendous social costs and that we lost enormous productivity that we could otherwise have if we had a more rational criminal justice system. And that, that's how I got involved. It, Nick, could you talk about how we have learned more about what works, which may have something to do with why there is some you know, there has been a significant growth in support uh, for this cause. You know, just not long ago we were passing three strikes and you're outlaws. Many of the people who used to support those are now come, have now come full circle back to uh, uh, supporting criminal justice reform. Sure. Well, you know, I think that one of the most important things to, to say is that, that uh, we we haven't learned uh, simply because over the course of the past 20 years there have been a lot of new facts that have been delivered to us. There, uh, the, the facts in support of alternatives to incarceration in terms of the kinds of um, interventions that you can have in people's lives uh, that allow them to be more productive, that help address underlying issues of substance use or, or mental health have actually existed for some time. There has been a degree of debate but they got submerged in the, in the late 70s and in the, the 80s largely because of a political dynamic where it became, uh, as, uh, uh, particularly in the late 80s and early 90s, crime was, uh, was spiking in this country as it tends to cycl cyclically. And uh, elected officials and the media made much of this and created a hysteria. And one of the things that elected officials learned, um, there's a great uh, there's a great uh, uh, saying that I heard one state legislator say. He's talked about 
um, uh, uh, criminal justice bills being run-on bills, because he would, he would announce a bill and then go home and run on it. Um, and, that, and, and that political dynamic sort of pushed us, made us, uh, our democracy, choose a number of, of interventions, almost all of them incarceration and ratcheting up sentences, despite the facts that existed about what we knew uh, worked for many people, and in the absence of facts that those were the right things to do to, to solve the criminal justice problem. So what we are, where we are now, 20 years later, I think is, with, is uh, in a very different space where facts matter more. Um, we used to think about the criminal justice world as being a fact-free zone back then, but I think it is much less so, less so today. And people do have a sense that there are alternatives that are more productive for the lives of the people who are coming through the criminal justice system, but also for their, their communities and then for society as a whole. Back in the, those days, you talked about Saturday Night Live ran a parody of political commercials at the time where one candidate ran on the slogan, cruel, unusual, effective. So it gives you a sense of, uh, of what that was about. How much did this problem that we now have arise from drug laws primarily, and how much of it was other sorts of uh, legislation? Well, drug laws are certainly a, 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 big, a big part of it. Um, and if you were to look at the federal prison system, which has over 200,000 people in it, a, a, close to perhaps a third of those who are in. The federal uh, prison system has many people who are locked up for, for drug laws. And if you were to then compare that to the Western democracies that we often compare this country to, you would not see a similar practice in those places as well. Um, it is also important to recognize that it's not just about drug laws uh, too. It is, this country tends to, um, there are sort of two main drivers that have gotten us to uh, 2.4 million people behind bars. Drug laws are, are part of both of those things, but overall, no matter what kinds of offenses you're looking at, um, we, we put people in prison for far longer than other countries do, uh, so it's, it's disproportionate. There is a principle in criminal justice called parsimony, which means that you should uh, sort of restrain oneself and, and ha make sure that you have a proportionality in the use of the most dramatic intervention that is possible, the taking of liberty from people, but we do not operate in a realm of parsimony or proportionality. Um, and then the second thing is that over the past 20 years is that uh, the, the yield has gotten higher. So as, uh, while the arrest rates have remained the same, more and more people are being sent to uh, jail and prison than they had before. So you, and that applies to drug crimes, to property, property crimes, to public order crimes, things of that nature. Bob, you wanted to... Let me, let me uh, EJ, let me mention a few numbers that have just, maybe because I'm or numbers oriented, but let me mention a few numbers that really struck me, and, and, and Nick, Nick alluded to one of them. The incarceration rate in the United States is six times the average of the OECD countries, and the OECD countries, as you know, are the large economic democracies. Secondly, uh, for people who've been in prison and then released, their incomes subsequently, their subsequent incomes are about, I think the number is, I may have it slightly wrong, but I'm roughly right, roughly 43 percent <coughs> below the incomes of people in similar circumstances. This is a like-to-like -like as best as that can be done. And I think it gives you a sense of how much, uh, how much negative impact incarceration has, both because of what happens in prison, people lose their skills, habits, one thing or another, and also because a lot of employers simply will not hire people who've been in prison. So we don't give them a chance to get back into the mainstream economy. An awful lot of people go into prison. Uh, I think something like a third of the people in prison don't have either high school degrees or GEDs. Very often these are people who come out of poverty, they've never had a chance in life. And instead of providing them rehabilitation, we provide them conditions that worsen their circumstances, worsen their capacity to get back in. Seven, roughly 650,000 people a year released from prison. And what we desperately need in this country, in my opinion, are effective, not only effective rehabilitation in prison, we should absolutely shorten incarceration, alternatives to incarceration, but we also need effective rehabilitation in prison instead of what we do, and we need effective prisoner release programs to enable people to get back into mainstream society and mainstream economy. Now, that will cost, oh, I'll give you one more fact. I'll give you one more number. 60% of the people who are released from prison don't have a job a year later. And that's not, on the whole, their fault. It's our fault. And it's our fault because we as a society are not preparing them to get back into the mainstream for, uh, workforce. And in many cases, employers simply will not hire people out of prison. 
All this is going to cost money, EJ, but I don't think there's any question that we could save enormously on the fiscal side to improve the incarceration capacity and just redeploy that money to these purposes. And secondly, this isn't social welfare spending. This is public investment. And I believe, E.J., this would be public investment with a very large rate of return. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because I am a voter in Harlem or Canarsie, in Louisville or Cleveland, and I come to you and say, A, why should I want to let these folks out of prison? Uh, and B, you know, you guys always say, well, if we invest this money uh, we'll get it back in the long run. How can you, how do you know that? How can we, those taxpayers, know that this is actually worth doing? I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, and Nick would know the answer to this better than I would, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's modeled this, but it should be modeled. But how do we know? I think if you spend a little time, and I've spent a little time, not much, but a little time, around this process, you just see how, how the, the, the terrible disadvantages so many of these people come into life with because they're born in poverty, uh, I had a son who volunteered at the Fortune Society, which is a great organization. I know they're on your program later. It helps people in prison release. And he told me just how, how, how lacking these people were. So many of these people were in linguistic skills and work habits and the like. And while I can't quantitatively prove <laughs> that there'd be a big return, I don't think any question when you look at people and then you look at what could be if only we would deal with these people effectively and enable them to get back into the, equip them to get back in the workforce, that the returns would be very large. But I think you make a very good point, which I've also thought of, that somebody should fund an effort to truly, if it's, if it's possible, to quantify this. EJ, if I could, I mean, just to, just to follow up on, on Bob's, Bob's point is that while there may be sort of no meta modeling that has been done, there's, there's a lot that we know. I mean, so Vera, Vera got its start in 1961. So this is just an example of, uh, of how you can keep people out of jail when they're arrested, when they're awaited, you know, in pretrial and awaiting their, their proceedings. Uh, typically in this country, we use bail, which is simply that you have to produce a certain amount of money in order to, to get out. And Vera got its start in 1961 by testing the efficacy of a different model, which is that simply you could look at someone's community ties. Do they have a fixed address? Do they have a family? Do they have children? Do they have um, a job? And that those indicia were just as likely to have, and in fact more likely to have someone return to their court proceedings than if they were out on money bail. And so if you use something like that as an example, then you're not keeping people, you don't lock people up um, and they can continue to be productive in their, in their lives while they're awaiting their cases. And one of the things that we've learned, if you, the criminal justice system is very complicated. We have state prisons where people are sentenced and go for many years, but in every city, in the country, in every county in the country, we have jails where people are waiting on pretrial. And <clears throat> one of the things that we know, so here's an example, is that 75% of the people who are in jails in this country, which are about 700,000 on a given day, 75% are in on public order offenses, drug offenses, nonviolent offenses, traffic violations, and they're often there because they can't pay bail. In New York City alone, 50% uh, of the people who are on Rikers Island are there because they can't pay $2,500 bail. And then if you look at non-felons, uh, one-third of them are there because they can't pay $500 bail. So, we, so one of the things that you realize is that at least in, in local justice systems, we're overusing incarceration when there are options that we know work better. And it's a very negative consequence to those people who get locked up because it, even two days spent in jail while you're awaiting pretrial um, has a number of, of, of effects. It makes it more likely that you'll be sentenced to prison in the future. It makes it more likely that that sentence will be longer. Uh, your rearrest rate is higher and then when you finally do get out you're likely to recidivate to essentially you know uh, act in the same way and be put back in jail. So if you think that that's what we're paying for, that we're paying $22 billion a year uh, in local jail systems and we're locking up this 75% of people who are really not uh, uh, safety risks and we're getting that kind of return, but we know that there are other options. I, I think that's a very compelling case to be made to voters. You probably have to figure out how to do that in about 30 seconds. Rather than <laughs> Could I give you Bob one? is going to do 30 I'll seconds. Give you one, I'll give you one <laughs> sentence answer. I, I was just thinking to myself, I, because the Local Industry Support Corporation is, is a community development organization that I happen to be involved with, and we've worked in low-income 
neighborhoods around the 36 cities. I've had people in these cities, in, in these communities say to me, look at what's happened because of people coming back into our communities from prison and nobody's equipping them to get jobs, nobody's equipping them to be effective parts of our society, and so it contributes to, to, the, to the problems in these inner cities instead of helping these people become part of mainstream society. So I think, I think there are a lot of people who would be responsive to that because they see it in their daily lives and, the, and the, the deleterious effects that it's had in their communities and in the families in their communities to release people into the society who can't get jobs and really are not equipped to, to function in mainstream society or, or, or mainstream economy. And it's a terrible cost to the nation. E to either of you, we just uh, celebrated or honored the 50th anniversary of Selma. How much does this have to do with race? Uh, it, has a, it has a great deal to do with race. I'm sure that people in the audience have read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, uh, which is, uh, and people may have different views on the extent to which the arguments in that, in that book are, are valid, but one of the things that she uh, very effectively did was document the way in which um, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, concern about the disruptions that were caused by the civil by the civil rights movement and concerned about uh, and concern about that ended up finding itself in into the criminal justice sphere that one of the means of oppression uh, was really to as crime rates were rising were to connect uh, criminal activity with people who are you know who are of of color and that and you see the documentation in sort of the legislative language and, and, and all of the rest. And so while our rush to incarcerate wasn't explicitly about uh, uh, locking up more people of, of color, it is, it is certainly something that was driving it underneath. Uh, undoubtedly, the uh, disparities are, are, are powerful uh, in this country, and it's not that people who operate within the criminal justice system all operate with explicit bias. It is far more complicated than, than that. There is implicit bias, which every single one of us in this audience um, uh, carries with us just as a, a being a, a member of this society. Um, there are policies that, that are race neutral um, that end up having a disparate uh, impact. I'll give you one example. Um, within the criminal justice system, one of the things that we look at and when we decide whether someone re should receive a sanction to be in custody or not is criminal history. And if you look at criminal history and you use arrest as the major index of that, but you know that there are communities in the country where, that are over-policed and where the arrest rate is very high, where uh, a behavior in one community would not be met with arrest, but in another community it would. That will have a disparate impact on people who are in that in that community. Um, so, so it's a it is a, a complicated stew that we're in. But undoubtedly, the the disparities are very clear. And then the one thing that I think is most striking to people is that you can. Here's one classic example. You asked about. About uh, about drugs, we know that Americans uh, of uh, whatever color, whatever ethnicity they um, they are, use drugs at the same rate. There is really no discernible distinction between whites, blacks, Latinos. Yet, uh, blacks are four times more likely to be arrested in this country for marijuana possession. Some of that, which leads to incarceration, than whites. That has something to do with over-policing. It has something to do with implicit bias. So, so the system is infected in certain, in certain ways, but it's not as simple as uh, you know, the architects or actors being explicitly racist. I just want to say I have a few more questions I want to uh, ask, but there will be mics going around this distinguished audience, so I want to bring you all in uh, soon. Just a couple of other questions I wanted to ask. There's a, I think they're represented here today, one of my favorite conservative groups, a group called Right on Crime, who have pioneered, uh, a group of conservatives who pioneered criminal justice reform. Um, and some of them are Christian conservatives who've read the gospel and what uh, the gospel says about prisoners. Uh, some of them are libertarians whose views are similar to liberal civil libertarians. I'm particularly interested in a third sort of part of that coalition who are fiscal conservatives uh, who look at state budgets and look at how much we spend on prisons uh, and say, if we, those fiscal conservatives, want to cut state budgets, 
uh, we can't continue what we're doing on sentencing. Can you talk about the, either of you, on the fiscal effects of what we're doing now? I'll give you one brief comment, if I may, AJ. There was a study done, and I've forgotten who did it, and I think it was, I think it was in 2000, I'm not going to swear to that, and the, the argument, that the, the point of the study, and it was by a serious group, was that increased incarceration uh, no longer had any uh, effect in terms of reducing the crime rate. That if it, even if it had at one point, it no longer was. So that we're spending more and more on incarceration and we're not getting any decrease in the crime rate. And what we're doing instead is we're undermining the ability of all these people to participate in our society in the way that I mentioned. But in addition, we have these enormous fiscal costs. And if you could reduce those fiscal costs substantially, then you would free up funds for education and all kinds of other purposes, including deficit reduction, if that's what you want to do with it. Yeah, Bob, Bob is right. I mean, I think that, that uh, people of every stripe, uh, you know, who expect from their government that we spend money wisely, that it produces results, look at the 80 billion or so, which I think the Hamilton mm -hmm. Project uh, cited as the annual number that's spent on, on corrections in this country, um, and uh, sees that you know, of the 700,000 people that are, that are released every year, we're likely to see them back in prison um, at, in, after three years. About 50% of them are going to return to prison. So we're spending a remarkable amount of money. Uh, I think s for states, corrections is, it, it has long been the fast, one of the fastest growing functions of, a, of, the, of the general fund budgets. Um, certainly overtaking K through 12, and certainly overtaking uh, uh, everything but healthcare. healthcare. Every, right, everything, everything but healthcare. Oh, and so I think people look at that and they say, well, what are the results that we're getting? And to make a final point uh, that Bob raised when he was talking about how uh, time in prison depresses people's earnings, you have to think about this in terms of the neighborhood effects that it has for certain neighborhoods in the, you know, in the in the country. Take Anacostia, our far southeast here, or East Harlem in, in New York, uh, or neighborhoods in Chicago. There was a study that was done recently that showed that in Chicago, the average rate of incarceration per neighborhood was around 500,000. And then there were certain neighborhoods in Chicago, some in the south and some in the west, where the, where the rate of incarceration was 4,000 was 4, per, uh, per 100,000 people. So it was eight times the citywide average. And if you think about the depression of, uh, of earnings multiplied out on all of those men who are, leaving, who are leaving prison and women who are leaving prison and are looking for jobs, but the jobs are not available for them and the stigma is there, it's, it is profound. Um, it's prof it's, and it's a profound challenge for the lives of those communities, but also for the cities and then I think for the country as a whole. Let me play sort of utter skeptic here and ask you both to answer the following. If you look at a lot of the things we have done on, in this area what, that we did in the past, they were a response to a real crime wave. I mean, people didn't invent the crime wave. It was real, starting in the late 60s and, and, and sort of extending really through the 80s, I think it's fair to say, or early 90s. Um, and you know, a couple of things happened. One is we passed all these sentencing laws. Support for the death penalty also soared uh, because people lost faith in the criminal justice system. Now we have gone through a period, happily for our country, of declining crime rates. Uh, skepticism of the death penalty has come back, which I welcome. Uh, and we now have this opening for sentencing reform. I'm sitting here as a skeptic and say, look, these laws may be unfair in some ways, and maybe we can get rid of the unfairness, but the fact is this tough policing and sentencing actually help bring this crime rate back down. How can you guarantee me that if we do all this stuff you guys are talking about, we won't return to uh, those crime rates that we reacted to all those years ago? Can I give me one sentence answer? Sure, and then okay. I'll give the you know, 12 paragraph answer. <laughs> yeah, that's because Nick knows a lot more than I do, but, <laughs> which is good. And you'll, you'll, you'll know the sites. Um, yes. th there are studies that have been done of this. I mean, serious studies. I mentioned this before. And they, what they strongly suggest is that all of this dysfunctionality we're talking about is no longer contributing to a reduced crime. It's just increasing the expense. Right. But you use a phrase that I think really is not what this is about. I mean, fairness is important. But if you forget fairness, I mean, I think fairness is very important. But even if you put aside fairness, you know, provide human costs, and the human costs are terrible, and you look at people in these circumstances, 
this is a, uh, if you look at it purely through an economic lens and through cost-benefit analysis for the society as a whole, you would not continue with these dysfunctional practices and, and laws that we, that we have. The, the, the dysfunctional, dysfunctionalities of our system, you would address. And I think race does enter into that because I think so many people in the little world that I live in really don't identify with this issue because I think it was a, it's just like poverty, yeah. D, EJ. You, you, I, I have the opportunity, fortunately, to live in a world that's pretty privileged. And when you talk to people, which I do, about poverty and the terrible effects it has, not only for the people involved, but on all of us, it's very hard to get people to relate to that. And I think it is a partly the fact that they're shielded by their financial situation, but I think it partly has a racial dimension to it, too. EJ, so you've, you've hit on the, the big challenge for all of us, not just for you and your role as, as skeptic, but for everyone that has listened to political dialogue um, and policy dialogue about this issue for the past 20, 25 years. And the most important thing is to do exactly what Bob just did, which is to decouple the notion that the incarceration rate and that our commitment to incarceration has very much to do with the drop in the crime rate. Uh, as, as Bob said, it, there, around 2000, when you look at long sentences and the massive use of incarceration, there are quite a few studies that have shown that the, there are diminishing returns, that the returns are quite marginal when it comes to keeping crime rates low. But everyone is used to talking about it in this context, and everyone has lived through the past uh, 22, 23 years where we've seen the crime rate drop and then we've seen a different chart of the incarceration rate, uh, incarceration rate rise and make an assumption that those two things are connected. But the National Res uh, Research Council, which put together a blue ribbon panel to look at all of the evidence around how we got to where we got in terms of uh, our society of mass incarceration and you know what its causes were, um, and what needed to be done to cure it, uh, looked at every bit of evidence that was out there, every study, and determined quite clearly that the, that the relationship between long sentences and reduction in crime is quite marginal. Thank you. I want to go to the audience. Um, if, uh, I, I have a lot of questions I can keep asking if you haven't had your coffee yet. But, uh, <laughs> sir, over here, uh, we have a mic coming to you. Uh, by the way, Nick, if I could ask you the one question I didn't get to, and you may just lace it into one of your answers, is this is the 20th anniversary of the passage of the 95 crime bill. And uh, maybe we should have a 20th anniversary uh, revisiting of the crime bill in Congress. Uh, but, sir. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Ron Weich. I'm, I'm at the University of Baltimore School of Law and a former trustee of the Vera Institute. Very proud of Nick and his colleagues for convening this session. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, ask uh, Secretary Rubin and Nick um, about the uh, very interesting and important experiment underway in criminal justice policy uh, due to marijuana legalization in Colorado and Washington State and Alaska and now to some extent here in the District of Columbia. Empirically, what's the right amount of time that we should wait before drawing conclusions about the economic and social impact of that important legal change and what do you predict will be the conclusions that we would draw after we wait that amount of time. So tell us what the data will be before we know the data, <laughs> but that's a great question. <laughs> Nick, you want to? Nick. The, so this is not my, my area of, of specialty, but I, and, um, and again, I think I would, I would return to, I mean, I would sort of look at the, the bigger picture, because I think that the data around marijuana use in this in this country and in other societies is actually uh, very, very clear that it, that it is, it is that the conclusion that we should be drawn to is not that use of marijuana is a criminal justice issue, but it is, um, but it, it is a, 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 a public health issue to the extent that it, is a, that it becomes extreme and is of concern, but we obviously have lots of controlled substances that are legalized in this country. There's alcohol and, and we tackle those things and there's cigarettes and we tackle those things in a very different, in a very different way. And if you compare again to our OECD colleagues um, across, you know, across the pond, uh, we know that they don't use criminal justice interventions. We don't arrest people. We don't put them in, in jail um, when they are in possession of, of marijuana. So, so I'm not sure, you know, I think that the thing that I'm interested in is watching sort of the, not so much the data that comes out of these experiments, but rather the extent to which that there is a, a broader political shift 
um, in terms of a willingness in many states to, to look at this in a, in, a, in a different way, in a way that the evidence has supported for a long time already. I'll make a prediction that I hope is wrong, and that is, and, and it goes to what Nick just said, I, I, I don't know enough about it to have a response to the directions you've answered, but what, what troubles me, and I've thought about this actually, is that as data develops, what is important is that we look at it in a rational cost-benefit way. And what troubles me is I think that something will go wrong someplace, and that will get a tremendous media exposure, and that will taint the whole way the political system looks at this instead of having a rational cost-benefit analysis to what happens. I, I think there's a real risk in this that, that we, we, will, we will draw the wrong conclusions. I'm shocked that you think our political system might react irrationally to something. It's well, well, I thought you were Inconceivable. Say, I, but I thought, you, I thought you were going to say something else, which is that you were shocked that I thought that the media might overreact in some unbalanced way to some particular yeah, yeah, yeah. fact. But. No, I'm shocked that you cared about one kind of high and not high markets or inflation or something. Um, who, uh, over here, the gentleman, I'm sorry to keep, oh, we got another mic? Yes, this gentleman in the front. Yeah. I think it's good for our web audience, our millions on the web. <laughs> My name is Charlie Sullivan, and I'm director of an organization called CURE, and I lobbied uh, Ron before he became head of the law school when he was working for uh, Senator Kennedy back uh, 20 years ago in the crime bill. Uh, I think uh, looking at the crime bill, we don't realize that uh, uh, another war really started. Uh, and that is the war on sex offenders. Uh, I don't know if people realize it. Uh, Congressman Jim Ramstead introduced the first, uh, the Whittling Bill, uh, that uh, began to look at sex offenders uh, and no matter that term, and began to even uh, lock them up, not only after they finished their criminal sentence, that was Adam Walsh Act, but they actually now serve sentences in civil commitment facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, New York has two of them. Uh, they're mostly liberal states. Right now, the one in Minnesota actually is being declared unconstitutional by a federal judge, as we talk, because they've only released three out of 720 years. So we are really moving uh, very rapidly into the war on drug, uh, from the war on drugs to the war on sex offenders, but no one seems to talk about it or even the vote or even question it. There is a bill, uh, and I'll finish, there is a bill right now uh, being considered in the Senate that passed the House by unanimous consent that would basically say that sex offenders cannot travel internationally. There wasn't any debate, there wasn't even one negative vote. So we're, we're really, this is going on, this war is raging. No one is saying that sex offenders should not be held accountable, but we, we needed a hammer, but we've, we are using a sledgehammer, very could, similar to I, what I, we did I, in the war me, on drugs. Uh, thank you, sir. Do you have a thought on that? Well, I, I think that that's, that is uh, part and parcel of the demonization that we've just gotten, that we're quite practiced at in this country when we think about, a, you know, about uh, uh, criminals and sex offenders are certainly in the past 10, 15 years the latest in, uh, in uh, a, a, a subset of people that are very easy to uh, target and to become hysterical about and to think about how they need to be locked up regardless of what the evidence might be for the remainder of their lives. But we do it in a broader context here too when we talk, you asked me a question about drug offenders, I talked to you also about nonviolent offenders, but we also group violent offenders uh, and we say well you know it's fine to keep violent offenders in in prison but we and we do that re reactively but then i would also ask a slightly different question which is to say if we think it's important to you know fine it makes sense to throw violent offenders in prison for a long long time do we think it makes sense to have 55 year olds and 60 year olds who are well past their age of, of criminal conduct and who have walkers and wheelchairs and diabetes and the rest locked up because they committed a crime of violence 10, 15 years ago. So I think that, so I raise that simply to say that the challenge is to sort of unpack all of these very sort of simple constructions that we have and sort of, the, you know, and the simple, it's fine to keep them locked up. Uh, but, you know, it's the others we need to be concerned about because they are much more com complex. I want to uh, want to bring in, uh, let me bring in the two of you. I think we're kind of approaching our time uh, here. So I'd like to bring in 
uh, the two questioners back there that I saw in, my, in the lights here. I'm sorry if I missed someone else. Uh, who were, yeah, uh, right? Hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me just, uh, just before you begin, and, and in response to these questions to close, could either of you talk very concretely about what this means? In other words, if a bill were to pass Congress, what kinds of provisions are we actually talking about changing? And so I'm going to take both of these questions, and then you can sort of answer mine and them in common. This will give you the chance to duck the hardest of these two uh, <laughs> questions. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Your question actually, I think, ties into what my concern is. I'm Andrea Alexander with the National Council of Churches. I serve as the Associate General Secretary for Justice and Peace, and we're working on issues of mass incarceration. Uh, currently, any felony conviction is basically a lifetime sentence because of the impact it has, and not just on that community, but on that family Correct. from generation to generation. How do you reconcile um, this issue around uh, new sentencing laws and things like that when the real focus is an economic impact of prisons? So you have a kind of a more conservative view that we're spending money on prisons and, and that's a conservative kind of approach. But if we don't also address uh, poverty, um, access to social resources, education, um, we're going to end up with uh, uh, the system being just impacted in a whole different way. Can you kind of speak to that when you get a chance to answer? Amen to that question. Thank you so much. And then the gentleman right behind there. Uh, my name is Chris Wellborn, I'm a criminal defense lawyer in South Carolina, and I had the pleasure of serving on the NACDL National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Restoration of Rights Project. And one thing that's not been brought up in, in this whole big picture, but I think it is, it is a massive piece from what we learned during our um, conferences and, and the testimony that we took around the country, is the public safety uh, benefit of a more rational process whereby people are not kept for so long, they have a, a pathway out that provides employment that doesn't, um, using a horrible term, but doesn't ghettoize them into certain neighborhoods where they're restricted either because of lack of licensure or they're restricted because of housing regulations because they have a felony, they can't live in a certain neighborhood or live in a certain house. We heard from prosecutors, police chiefs, corrections officers who all saw this as a massive concern and thought that not from just, just a pure public safety aspect of what else are they going to do if they can't find work and they have no hope. So, so in, in addressing the big picture, that's something that I thought perhaps may be worth talking about. Those are two sort of allied questions. Um, you want to, I started with Bob, so I'll let you end. So I'll go Bob first and then Nick. Yeah, let me pick up on it, and I think I can do this in brief. The, the question about poverty and its interrelationship with dysfunctionality of, of, this, of the, of the, of the uh, criminal justice, I think you're exactly right. And I think they're parallel issues, and I think we all have an enormous stake in, in, in dealing with both these kinds of issues. And I think what you said about uh, conviction for a felony being a lifetime sentence is, is, is also correct. Uh, I, I think we should do five, five, and by the way, what you said about uh, public safety, another point, because it, once you put people into prison, as Nick said, you, you then have all kinds of dysfunctional effects on these people. And the results are much higher recid recidivism rates and, and higher crime rates. And you can actually reduce crime rates, I think, by having a much more functional system. I think if there, there are five things, well, I don't know if they're exactly five, but we should have alternative sentences rather than prison. When we have prison sentences, they should be shorter. We have a desperate need for rehabilitation, and rehabilitation means basic learning skills. It, it's, it's helped people who have drug problems, it's psychological problems, one thing or another, so that people are equipped once they get out of prison to re-engage with mainstream society. We need more flexible parole systems because too often they're rigid. And then finally, and, and you do have the, the head of the Fortune Society here later, we'll talk to you about this, we have seven, roughly 700,000 people, 650,000 people, whatever it is, coming out of prison every year. And many of these people really were never equipped to be in mainstream society because they grew up in poverty. Poverty has terrible disadvantages for kids. 20% of our kids live in poverty. And we, we need far better uh, systems for, and regime for dealing with prisoner release. So those five things, if you had those five kinds of programs, EJ, I think you could have a tremendous economic effect aside from all else. And that's what we need to do. And, and I think the cost of it would probably be more than met by what we could save in terms of the fiscal cost of 
incarceration, but even if that isn't true, whatever we spend on that is public investment. How we get the public awareness of this that we need so that we get political pressure to get it done is, of course, another and very complicated question, but we do seem to be moving in the right direction. Uh, Bob got it exactly right, and that's why it's so gratifying to be up here on, on stage with you. It's, and I think that, you know, in, in response to what you said about the, the public conversation, the fact that you, a former Secretary of the Treasury uh, and someone with your experience and with your perspective on the world is talking about this is a tremendously important thing. Um, Bob also got it right in terms of the, the cure, and uh, just imagine this sort of beautiful um, uh, counterexample. Imagine if we spent uh, $80 billion every year um, all, on alternatives to incarceration, on the kinds of services in the communities that are, that are uh, needed, on programs in prison to help those who are in prison now be able to transfer out and to be able to do so successfully, um, that's, a, that's a kind of justice reinvestment that would make a lot of sense both in terms of uh, individuals' economic potential and then the success for, for communities and then also for public safety because as the last uh, questioner um, really made the point, uh, addressing the underlying concerns that people have and then putting people into a position to succeed in life is the public safety, you know, pro promises and delivers public safety benefit. I think the last thing that we really need to do is we have to think about future flow, is that if we have to figure out how to reduce long sentences and mandatory minimums if we want to move away from that 2.4 million people who are locked up right now. And even if we were to half that, and we have to remember that this took 40 years to get here, so it's going to take some time to get back to a better place. Even if we were to half it, uh, we would still be well ahead of, of Germany and the Netherlands and uh, Britain and all the other countries that we see ourselves as being peers with. Well, I want to thank both of you for kicking off this great discussion. Um, there aren't many issues that combine justice and fiscal responsibility and improving the lives of families and communities. So I hope this discussion moves 21 blocks away uh, to Capitol Hill, not just because it's right, but also because it's smart. Thank you so much. Capitol Hill. <laughs>